Hello, and thank you very much uh, for joining us for today's Bicentity Connect webinar. My name is Marianne Comparet, and I'm speaking from the International Society for Neglected Tropical Diseases. Uh, so we've been putting on this series of short talks in the fields of tropical diseases and global health to help professionals and researchers remain connected and engage with a wide and international audience during the lockdown period. And over the past 11 weeks, it's been a real pleasure delving twice weekly into the science and policy discussions across a really varied range of topics and diseases. Um, so after a very successful talk given on behalf of the Global Schistosomiasis Alliance by Derek Osakonor from the University of Edinburgh on the current gaps in schistosomiasis treatment, um, today we're delighted to be hosting the first talk from a special GSA series, which will be held as part of the ICENTD Connect meetings. But today, we're not here to discuss a specific research paper or intervention, but we are here for a very special and joyful occasion. And in fact, a real celebration of an entire body of research. Um, and actually beyond that, a lifetime's work in schistosomiasis, immunoparasitology and tropical diseases and of course the many successes, friendships, anecdotes and reflections gathered along this journey. So after 50 years in these fields, it's our absolute pleasure to welcome Dr. Dan Colley to share a few stories and thoughts with us today about where a 50 year career in schistosomiasis can take you geographically and scientifically. Um, Dr. Colley has, of course, been involved in a huge number of collaborations and projects worldwide, probably with many of the attendees uh, at today's webinar. Mm -hmm. And uh, just to name a few uh, in Brazil, Egypt, Kenya, St. Lucia, uh, Dr. Colley, you've also been director of the Division of Parasitic Diseases at the US CDC for nine years, mm -hmm. director of the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases at the University of Georgia. Uh, you also directed the Schistosomiasis Consortium for Operational Research and Evaluation, also known as SCORE, and now mm -hmm. soon uh, to retire as Professor Emeritus of Microbiology at the University of Georgia. Uh, so Dr. Colley, apart from being perhaps a little tired following all this huge body of work, um, how are you today? I'm just fine, Marianne, thank you. Wonderful. I'm covering at home and doing well. That's Great to hear, and uh, so thank you so much for joining us today. Um, and since we will be hearing about your experience and also what is no doubt an immensely important legacy to the field of tropical diseases and the next generations of researchers, uh, we are also absolutely delighted to welcome along yourself our colleague and friend, Dr. Julia Chami, uh, who's currently research group leader in the Nuffield Department of Population Health at the University of Oxford. And Juliet is particularly interested in improving the reach and effectiveness of preventative chemotherapies for schisto and is also an extremely passionate researcher in the field, uh, working with quantitative and computational techniques and epidemiology to improve clinical outcomes in East Africa. So we're in very good company this afternoon and a very big hello to you, Juliet. Um, how are you doing and how, where are you speaking from? Uh, I'm doing pretty well. Uh, I'm somewhere in between Oxford and London in the Chilterns, uh, where I'm locked down, but happily so. So things are okay here. Beautiful. Okay. Glad to hear it. Um, so today, Juliet, you are uh, acting as our ambassador. You're representing the future of schistosomiasis schistosomiasis <laughs> research and control. And uh, we thought it would be a really great, um, you know, a very nice and enjoyable session for us all to sort of uh, have you both in conversation. And perhaps you could ask uh, Dr. Coley many of the burning questions which um, our colleagues and friends and certainly our field may have um, just at the end of this beautiful career. So without any further ado, I will hand over to both of you and uh, we look forward to hearing a lot more about the many stories and adventures along this 50 year career. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you, Marianne. And thank you for inviting me to be in conversation with Dan, which I have very much been looking forward to. 
So Dan and I met in Zanzibar when he was launching an elimination campaign for schistosomiasis. And unlike many people that are tuned in today, Dan and I haven't actually directly collaborated on a paper per se, but the schisto community is quite tightly knit. So we keep crossing paths, even the, uh, through either my mentors, PhD supervisors, meetings. So I'm really curious as well to hear what Dan has to say about this amazing 50 year career. And I'd like to start off actually at the tail end of this half century of research. You had mentioned SCORE when you were introducing Dan. So Dan, SCORE has been the focus of your research for the past decade or so. Um, and I'd like to hear a bit more about what SCORE is and how this idea even came about. Sure, uh, SCORE uh, is a program that really had its genesis in January of 2008 uh, when Julie Jacobson from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation called me up. I did not really know Julie. I had met her very briefly um, at, a US, uh, at a meeting at uh, the NIH, oh, I don't know, sometime in the fall of 2007. And then I saw her going up an escalator while I was going down at a Trump Med meeting. And I waved to her and she waved back. And that's all I knew about Julie Jacobson. Uh, so when I got a call from her in January of 2008, uh, it was a cold call. I didn't know what she was doing or whether it was one of my friends spoofing me when she said, this is Julie Jacobson from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And I went, oh, hi. And she went on to ask me if, well, she told me that the Gates Foundation was interested in a program to do operational research on schistosomiasis. And would I be interested in heading up such a program? And I went, uh, what do you mean by operational research? <laughs> because that can mean many things to many people. And fundamentally, I'm an immunologist and I don't do operational research, although I have a background in public health from the time at CDC that Marianne mentioned. I don't really think of myself as a operational research public health person. We came to the agreement that operational research would mean doing programs that if they work, because they were to be research, if they work, and we know research doesn't always work, uh, then the outcomes would be useful to program managers, NTD program managers, in controlling or eliminating schistosomiasis. So the research couldn't be real basic. Uh, I couldn't spend a dime of this on my immunology trying to watch lymphocytes jump through hoops. That's not what this was about. And I said, sure, why not? <laughs> And she said, okay, uh, let's talk about this. And so we did over the next couple of months. Uh, during that pre-proposal period, because even though they called me up and asked me to do this, we had to write a pre-proposal, we had to write a real proposal, it had to get reviewed and all of that. Uh, but during that time, uh, we held um, a series of meetings, or I held a series of meetings uh, in Europe and the United States, uh, the European meetings had some partners from Africa in them uh, to discuss what this might look like because it was going to be a large pot of money and it was going to be funding a consortium. And so I went around and I think there were five of those meetings uh, to different places with groups gathered to figure out what their input would be. What do you, what would you do if you, were approached to do this. Uh, then over the summer of 2008, uh, we wrote and rewrote the proposal and it was funded in November of 2008, right at the end of November, which was a very cataclysmic time financially in the markets and the Gates Foundation has a lot of investments. So Julie went to bat for us and we ended up getting funded um, and we wrote it so that there would be an opportunity for the first year to try and figure out what we would actually do. 
And so we held a series of seven meetings uh, of expert panels on different topics that we thought might come under operational research. Uh, most of those were held here in Athens, Georgia at UGA. One of them was held in London. Um, and out of those, we wrote the actual proposals uh, and outlined the protocols that would be in the proposals. And then we sent them out widely to get people to write proposals. And then the tough part came in trying to pick which proposals to fund. And so basically the score secretariat, which I had put together, was acting as a mini granting agency. Of course, the Gates Foundation had final say if we went off the rockers on something. Um, but basically, Julie let us alone and uh, we kept her very well informed. And by the end of 2019, uh, 2009, we were starting to fund things. And the things we funded were what I thought would be operational research. The only real basic science question that we funded was to get some genomics done on uh, schistosoma hematobium. At that time, there really was, there was no genome for S hematobium. And we thought that was probably needed and begrudgingly, but yes, Julie agreed that that was a topic that we could get started at any rate. We wouldn't be the major funder for it, but we would fund a couple of groups to come together, get some specimens and do microsatellites and figure out what microsatellites might be. So that was a basic science kind of a thing, uh, but it was done in preparation of trying to look at the genomics of S. hematobium, and we already knew how to do that with, with Manson High, uh, under drug pressure in some of the studies, the field studies that would be done. Field studies were the big deal. They were huge projects. Um, we had several different kinds of field studies that were started. This was to be a five-year grant. It ended up being a 10-year grant uh, because there are always glitches along the way. And we were fortunate enough with the Gates Foundation to get them to agree to try to work with us on those glitches and extensions and things, small civil wars here and there that got in the way. Um, and so the field studies, one of the sets of field studies uh, done in Kenya and Cote d'Ivoire uh, were to find out if you had a, a relatively low, and for us that was between 10 and 25% prevalence, of schistosomiasis, what did it take to keep it that low or get it lower? So those were called sustaining studies. The gaining studies that were done, um, and they were done in three places, in Mozambique and in Tanzania and in Kenya, those were gaining studies to get on top of anything above 25%. Now, most of the places at that time, this was, remember, back in 2000 nine and 10, uh, most of the places were actually at much higher prevalence at 50, 60, 80%, sometimes 90%. So these were gaining control studies to try to figure out, okay, what does it really take to dampen this down to something that could be more manageable uh, or at least sustainable? These were big studies. They involved, for the gaining studies, they involved 150 villages in each location. Uh, in the sustaining, there were 75 in each location. Uh, the 75 were split into three arms, the, the 150 were split into six arms. And we tried different things in terms of uh, the frequency of praziquantel mass drug administration, which was the thing of the day. Um, skipping years skipping every little year, doing community-wide, doing school-based, and trying to keep track of all of that in tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people in stools and urines. Uh, these were all done in collaboration. Uh, most of them, well, all of them were done in north-south collaborations uh, with people who had already worked with each other in most cases and worked rather extensively, some of them. 
um, all of them were done with the knowledge and sometimes integration into the NTD program. So they weren't standalone research separate from the ministry kinds of things. Uh, some of them ended up being quite integrated and in. some of them were more, we know what you're doing, you know what we're doing and that's fine, we'll follow up with you. Uh, but all of them involved that kind of marriage, which is not always easy. We also had some studies, the one that you and I met each other in, the ZEST program, uh, SCORE was the research component of the ZEST program to try to, uh, the, the research program was to try to see what, what it would take to try and eliminate S hematobium in a place where it was already pretty low and had undergone lots of MDAs. Uh, so we had that program on Zanzibar and we had a seasonal program for elimination to see if we could get it down in Cote d'Ivoire, which is still finishing up and writing papers at this point. Um, we also tried to do elimination studies in Rwanda and Burundi. Uh, both of those, the mapping was done and generated lots of good information, but the studies never really got off the ground. Um, for one reason or another, it, certainly in Burundi, because that they started having civil uprisings and no one could go to the field. So those were the big field studies. We've also had major studies in SCORE on diagnostics in terms of mainly two things. One was evaluation of the point of contact CCA assay that had just become commercially available at the beginning of SCORE. And we had a number of studies, quite extensive studies, on how that assay compared to the Cato cats or S. mansoni. We don't have a field ready assay for hematobium other than dipsticks, uh, hemosticks, which are okay, but not what we would like. Uh, so the point of contact CCA assay was quite extensively studied in a number of different places, starting out with a five country study where five different countries did exactly the same thing. And then we brought all of those together to analyze together as well as each of them analyzing them separately. And then we had a little, we had a number of side studies that were done looking at the point of contact CCA after treatment, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the other diagnostic component was done in connection with the Leiden University Medical Center uh, and Govert and Paul there, and the UCP LFCAA assay. And SCORE funded that group to work quite hard to make that assay, which is highly specific, more and more sensitive. So we got it down to a point where it could detect a single worm pair in a baboon. Now you only know that because you can perfuse baboons. I personally am the only person you'll ever talk to who has witnessed two human perfusions and is still alive. Wow. Uh, they were live perfusions, we won't do that. Again. But in baboons, you can do that. You can follow the number of actual worms. So those were the diagnostic kinds of things that we did. Um, there were some other things here and there, but those were the biggest major studies. Now, I would like to tell you and inform our audience that from these studies, we now have a supplement to the American Journal of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene that will be coming out in July. But all of those articles, there are 16 of them. One is an introduction by the guest editor, uh, Robert Bergquist, and the other 15 are either from the Secretariat or conglomerates of the, the SCORE consortium. And I don't know if this will show or not, but maybe I should just read it. They're all online right now. And if you go to ajtmh.org slash SCORE, you can see them all in their preprint forms, in their proof forms. But this will come out sometime in July. I'm gonna give you a special treat. The cover of this, this supplement will have a quilt on it 
made by my wife, designed by two, of the, two other people in the Secretariat, myself and Nipur Couture, quilted by my wife, who is a quilter, and it is behind me. And I will get out of the way, and you will see what this cover of this supplement will look like. It will have this quilt on it that says, score, operational research on controlling and eliminating schistosomiasis, has the score logo up at the top, has some village scenes here, and some huts and houses along the side. So we're quite proud of that. My wife who's sitting in the other room laughing, um, did all of the quilting on it, and then we had it professionally photographed so that it'll be a cover of this supplement. I've told you the very highlights of SCORE, what sorts of things we did. I think the important thing to remember about SCORE is that we eventually had programs in 18 different countries, sub-awards numbering in the 40s or 50s, maybe more. Tammy will kill me because I don't know the actual number. Uh, we held an annual meeting every year of the people in the consortium and a few people from outside each year. They were really dirty laundry kinds of meetings. We held these meetings here in, in Athens, Georgia, and everybody told what they had done that year and what had failed, which is the dirty laundry, what never got done because of one reason or another. And we all sat around and talked about those and decided what we would do about some of the problems and where we were and what progress was being made uh, because there was always a lot of progress as well as the Derby Laundry. So those annual meetings forged the consortium that was quite dispersed otherwise. And I think they were really very important. Um, that's pretty much it, but you better go to the supplement either online or when it comes out, and then you'll learn everything. Well, could I press you for a few spoilers? Mm -hmm. What are some key messages from the field studies? Oh, well, in the last issue, in the last article in the uh, supplement, we list them out in the table. Um, but I'll try to remember a few of them. Okay, so the first thing is, and remember when these started, these started in 2009 and 10. So the first thing, so the, the schistosomiasis control initiative that preceded SCORE had shown that yes, indeed, you could do mass drug administration with Praziquantel in a number of African countries working within the ministry and the SCI program. That was really important. So, we started SCORE from a point where we knew it could be done, but it took SCI a lot of effort, a lot of funds, and at that time, a lot of money for Prozzi Quantum. And what we were trying to do was, okay, you can do it. What can you do best? How can you do it best? What we found was if you do reasonably high coverage, mass drug administration, even starting at 90% prevalence, you do pretty well. You can knock annual MDA, can knock down prevalence and intensity quite well, but it has to be done and be regular. If you skip every other year, you can still do a pretty good job, not as good. If you skip two years, yeah, now you're getting to a point where you're not doing nearly as well, but it's still knocking it down. Even when you do these things starting at low prevalence, below 25%, you never eliminate it. And that was a second message, if you will. So annual, biennial, both work, but what's your goal? Is your goal to just knock it down and sort of keep it there? Or is it to continue to knock it down? And that's gonna take more. So those were really important messages. And out of these studies, because they were large studies with 25 villages per arm, what we found was every arm, no matter whether you gave it annually 
or actually even by annual Lee on Zanzibar, there were always some villages, locations that did not respond well. And we call those persistent hotspots. Persistent because they are there in the face of continued MDA. Annual MDA and biannual MDA certainly doesn't get rid of them. And biennial doesn't get rid of them as well, even. So there are always these persistent hotspots where prevalence and intensity often stays up. And that's a problem. And it's a problem that we might have anticipated, but we really didn't. They were a surprise to me. I was hoping for much more homogeneity in every arm. And what we got were these persistent hotspots in every arm, which certainly plays heck with your statistics. And more importantly, it plays heck with the whole point of the program because you are clearly leaving some places unhelped. Why? We don't really know. We have a couple of sort of feasibility assessments looking at factors and things. They were done on a small scale right at the end of SCORE, and they don't really show a whole lot. Um, you know, they looked at things like latrine coverage, et cetera, et cetera, um, snail coverage, et cetera, et cetera. None of it jumped out big time. A few things were learned, but not big time. So I think that's sort of the third major message of SCORE is even when you think you're doing great, it's not happening everywhere. And you need to be able to find those. Now, one of the messages is, we think you can find those after two years of MDA. Before you go into the third year of your MDA, if you're doing it annually, you could test if you have easily available field tests and tell which ones didn't respond, which are persistent hotspots. And we think that's very important. Uh, we'll see whether WHO and others think that that's important enough to be in the guidelines, but we certainly feel so. And we have plenty of data that says so. The other, another message is that the eggs per gram in low, medium, and high, or moderate and high for hematobium, doesn't tell you what morbidity is. Those, the 400, the 100 and 400 egg cutoffs were developed a long time ago, not quite in my youth, not that long ago, but close. And they were done on the basis of severe morbidity, not the kind of morbidity we see in most places. Okay, Narciss, I agree. Uganda has some special things. But in most places with good MBA, you don't see the kind of morbidity that we used to see, the hepatosplenism, the, the carcinoma of the bladder. There's very much less of that now. There's still some. Of course there is, and that's worth noting and trying to figure out why. But in most places, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about what I used to call subtle morbidity. Charlie King would like me to call functional morbidity, and I will do so because I always do what Charlie says because he's smarter than me. But we don't think that the cutoffs are useful. 400 eggs per gram, I've used it up my whole career. I don't think it tells me what I need to know when I'm trying to control or eliminate just the When I'm trying to do a, you know, a scientific study and I'm trying to correlate it with immune responses, fine. But that's not the same as doing it in terms of public health. And we think that programs should be based more on prevalence. As things get more and more MDA, that's going to be more important. And cutoffs for, for eggs per gram or eggs per mil aren't going to be as important in my opinion. Thank you very much, Dan. I think it's fair to say that overview of SCORE is really the overview of the key operational research issues around schistosomiasis and uh, highlighting with your key messages what work still needs to be done for evaluating the assumptions we use for mass drug administration, whether it's its responsiveness or how we evaluate morbidity. There's still perhaps 
a lot to be done in this area. So I want to kind of switch our discussion and, and go a bit back to your early career, because as you mentioned in passing, you are not always an operational researcher or a public health researcher. You are an immunologist. So I kind of want to know what happened along the way. Did you miss your stop on the career bus? How do you end up from being an immunologist um, and if I'm right to say without a course in parasitology to being one of the leading <laughs> parasitologists and public health experts in the area how, what happened along the way <laughs> so. I don't know if I missed my stop or I got off too early um, uh, I started out uh, I went to a very small undergraduate college had 525 students in the whole school yeah. Center College of Kentucky was the quintessential liberal arts small college in the U.S. And that's where I went. I wasn't sure what to major in. So I majored in a lot of stuff because I didn't care more about one thing than another. And the dean actually called me in and threatened me that I would have to leave if I didn't declare a major because I was now in my junior year and you had to declare a major. And I sat in his office scared to death and said, biology. <laughs> because it was interesting, wasn't All right. a lot more interesting to me than history, but it was more interesting. So I majored in biology and minored in about four other things. And when I got ready to graduate, or close to it, my senior year, I decided that I probably wanted to be a teacher. I wanted to be a teacher in some place like Center College. And I realized that Center College only had two full-time faculty in the biology department. And one of those was a microbiologist and one of them was an ornithologist. The ornithologist never got to teach what he got his PhD in, never, because we weren't specialized enough to teach ornithology as a class. The microbiologist, on the other hand, every school has a microbiology class. So I said, okay, I think I've got to get a PhD. I think I'll get it in microbiology. Fortunately, Tulane University accepted me, gave me an NIH pre-doctoral fellowship, and I went off to get a degree in microbiology. My first publication with the first person I did a rotation with was on Phyx-174, a small single-stranded DNA bacteriophage. So I was gonna be a molecular phage geneticist. Whoa! And this was in 1965 when nobody knew what molecular biology was, and we knew a little bit more about phages. He moved to California, and I knew I wouldn't get my wife to move to California. It was enough to drag her to New Orleans. Uh, and I didn't want to go to California anyway, so I blamed my wife. I then had to pick something else to do my PhD on, because I had planned to do it on Phi X, 174. Uh, I was taking an immunology course and I was fascinated with it. Plus the guy that taught it, who would be my mentor, was known as very tough and a straight shooter, a very straight shooter. So I said, okay, I'm gonna go ask Dr. Charlie DeWitt if I can do a PhD with him. And I did it. He was the transplantation immunologist at Tulane. And so I did my PhD developing a program where you could do mixed lymphocyte reactions with rat lymphocytes, and that couldn't be done at the time. And through lots of trial and error, I got it to work, and we got it to do a few things in rat transplantation that led to the kidney transplants that he was doing. And I said, great, I am an immunologist. I'm a cellular immunologist. And I went off to do a postdoc with actually one of the luminaries of cellular immunology at the time, Byron Waxman at Yale. There at Yale, I worked on separating thymocytes, cells from the thymus. We didn't know what they did. We didn't know T cells and B cells. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I can't imagine not. <laughs> my, my first, my, my best publication from my postdoc is in the Journal of Experimental Medicine, and it starts off, lymphocytes leave the bone marrow, go to the thymus, and undergo maturation, and leave as 
so-called T lymphocytes. We hadn't decided, the, the community hadn't decided that's what we'd call them yet. Now, there were others right at that time, this was 1969 and 70, who were developing the tools, Marty Raff and others were getting the tools to separate out T and B cells to tell the difference, but we weren't sure. So I thought my whole career would be about T lymphocytes. And in many ways it was, but it was to use them on something I'd never heard of. Byron came into the lab one day after having given a series of lectures in Latin America about a year before and said, who wants to go to Brazil? <laughs> my wife and like did, not have, <laughs> did not have passports. We had never been anywhere except Canada and Mexico. And a weekend with the Marine Corps in Tijuana does not count as out of the country. I'm sorry. I spent a lot of time in Canada and I like that. So we had to get passports. And when I said, when I got his attention, I said, what for? And he said, oh, to teach a course in immunology. And I thought, surely I can do that. I'm a postdoc at Yale, I can do that. And help reorganize some research. And I said, well, what's the research on? And he said, just a somiasis. I went, huh? What's that? He said, oh, it's a worm infection. Oh, yeah. I mean, I went to Tulane, which is a big place for tropical medicine, but I was a, not, I was on the same floor, totally separate from all the tropical disease people. I didn't know what just a somiasis was. I couldn't spell it, couldn't pronounce it. And I said, what I can learn about it. Byron arranged for me to spend some time, like two days in Ken Warren's lab, and he was a person in schistosomiasis, and with Dr. Sue, Dr. and Mrs. Dr. Sue in Iowa, and then an important visit with Victor and Ruth Nusenzweig, who had been essentially expelled from Brazil at that time because it was a military dictatorship. And they both very much encouraged me to go to Brazil, even though they weren't in Brazil anymore, um, and to get into parasitology. As you know, Ruth Nussensweig is a luminary, was a luminary in malaria. Victor is a polymath in immunology and lots of other things. So Mary Paxton and I got our passports and took off. We spent two weeks on St. Lucia on the way funded by my pre-doctoral fellowship, or my postdoctoral fellowship, by the way, to visit research and control, which was a program the Rockefeller Foundation had for about 18 years on St. Lucia to figure out how best to control just smiles. Everything SCORE has done has been repeating what research and control did, and some of what they did, we, they did better. It's amazing. Pip Jordan's book should be read by anybody that thinks they ought to think about controlling schistosomiasis. But I had two weeks of an introduction to schistosomiasis by some of the very best people in the field. People like Joe Cook as the physician, Pip Jordan as the overseer, Bob Sturick as a snail guy, Guy Unrau as the engineer. Remember engineers in schistosomiasis? No, nobody remembers engineers in schistosomiasis. <laughs> They were a critical part of controlling schistosomiasis before drugs. Yeah. Absolutely critical. And they could be, again, drain the swamp, irrigate better. Those are engineering feats. We aren't using them. It's stupid. But it's all there in the book. And lots of papers that were published as well. But Pip Jordan's book is certainly the best book. Peter Jordan, 1988, oh, 89, something like that. Might be out of print, but I know somebody who has a PDF of the whole thing. Anyway, off we went to Brazil to Recife, which in 1970 was considered by Brazilians as pretty much the boondocks in the Northeast. Nordestinos are the people who Brazilians make fun of or were. Um, it was terribly enlightening. I didn't get a lot of immunology done. I taught a course that was supposed to be only for faculty 
I threw a hissy fit and we got a few students to be able to sit in the back. Um, it was interesting trying to teach immunology in Portuguese and English, Portuguese. But I came away from Brazil back to the United States to a job in Nashville, Tennessee at Vanderbilt University School of Medicine and the VA Medical Center there, the Veterans Administration Medical Center. There. And they allowed me to set up a life cycle. I had to go down to the CDC. The only time I was at the CDC before I interviewed there, I went down and picked up snails, bought some mice and started a life cycle. And for three, four, four years, I did mouse immunology on Shisco, S. Manson, right? And, but I had made myself a promise that once I got semi-established in this new field, nobody knew me. I was bringing in cellular immunology, which hadn't been really used except in Ken Warren's so. lab. But I made myself a promise that once I got sort of established, I would get a grant to go work on people with Cisco. And so in 1975, I went back to St. Lucia, my wife and I, and our son Tom, who was two and a half, and worked for four summers on St. Lucia as part of research and control where I had an absolutely wonderful relationship with Joe Cook, who was the physician and who know all about these patients. I mean, if you're an immunologist doing immunology on people with a disease, any disease, you are so limited by what you can interpret unless you have somebody to tell you what these people have and what their lives are like, because that's the information that your lymphocytes jumping through hoops should be measured against. And I had a perfect situation. At that time, you didn't even treat people. We could follow people with just a smile because the drugs were worse than the disease. That went on for four summers. I spent three months back in Brazil with Giovanni Gazzinelli, who comes in later. Um, but you can see I was beginning to slip into mouse and human immunology. It was all immunology because that's what I brought to the table. I certainly didn't bring parasitology to the table. I had to teach parasitology, the limited amount that medical students get in the United States at Vanderbilt, which means I had to learn enough to put them on a PowerPoint and show them and say the words. So I had to learn to pronounce a lot of things I didn't know how to pronounce. But I was a parasitologist. I was an immunologist working on a parasitic disease in humans and in, pe in people and in lots. That went on. Um, when St. Lucia ended, uh, we got a grant to work in Brazil with a guy named Giovanni Gazzinelli, who was the perfect collaborator. I mean, I've had lots of good collaborators. Giovanni was the best. That hurts some people's feelings, sorry. The best because of his practicality. If he said he could do it, that meant he could do it. If he said he couldn't do it, shut up, figure out a better way. Oh, okay, don't, don't waste my time trying to do something you can't do. And I've had really good collaborators that are, that follow in Giovanni's mold. He died last year and I really miss him. Um, so, you know, at one point, I had a program in both Brazil and Belo Horizonte with Giovanni and Zygmunt Brenner on Chagas disease because many of our patients had both diseases, so we studied them both. For an immunologist, you just get a different antigen and ask the same questions. Turns out they come out different answers. Oh, now that's interesting. Chagas and Schisto are quite different in terms of what the immunology is doing. So anyway, uh, then I got um, a grant from the Edna McCall Clark Foundation to work in Egypt. And I worked with uh, Professor uh, Dr. Uh, Mohammed El Alami and his group in Warak Al Arad and got to meet Reda Ramsey as my technician at the time. I now have great collaborations with Reda. He is one of my best friends. Uh, but he was started out as my technician in, in Warak. Um, at that point, 
we were doing things both in Egypt and Brazil, and it got really difficult to keep up with because I kept, I was on a plane a lot. But it was good. We actually even worked for three years on trachoma in Egypt because the patients had trachoma. They didn't have Chagas disease, but they had schisto and trachoma. So we ground up different bugs and had different antigens and asked the same sort of question. Brazil continued, Egypt finally dropped off. Um, and Brazil continued and we did a lot of things and trained lots and lots of people of which I am very, very pleased. Um, a lot of Brazilians flocked to Giovanni's lab because it was so active and they kept in the field, many of them. Um, at that point, I was still doing mouse work and I had a call from a guy that I had known for a number of years, Victor Song, who was at CDC. And he said, Dan, we're looking for a new director because our director is going to retire at some point. And I wondered if you would be interested. And I said, Victor, you know me, I don't do what you guys do. And Victor said, well, you just say that because you don't know what we do. And I went, well, that's true. I don't know what you do. I know you do public health. I don't do public health. He said, well, come on down anyway. Look around and give a seminar and, you know. And I went, yeah, sure. Fine. I mean, I had an NIH merit award at the time, which is 10 years of funding. I was two years into it. Um, and I went down and was enthralled in many ways because the CDC does lots of things. It's a big bureaucracy. I was already in the government. I was in a VA medical center. So it was a lateral move in terms of government. And in the long run, I said, yes, I don't know why. I have no real clue why. I think it was because I thought, oh, I've been doing all this overseas stuff and I've never had real epidemiologists to work with and they could tell me so much more about this. Well, it's true. It's a learning opportunity. It was a mining opportunity yeah. at great cost. The learning curve upon hitting the ground at CDC was huge. I didn't know any of this stuff. I, as you pointed out, I'd never had a course in parasitology and I'd never had a course in epidemiology. And I was now at the CDC and shortly to become because the director died. Unfortunately, Bob Kaiser died and I had to become the director right away with no read in. So here's this whole division of people that numbers a lot of folks very good at what they do who now have a director who knows nothing about what they do. Ooh. And it's a pretty hierarchical place. And so when people call up the Division of Parasitic Diseases and they want someone to come talk to them about something, they want the director. I would get, a, you know, they would call and I'd say, uh, well, you actually, you probably should talk to Barbara Herwald. She's the lead epidemiologist on that study. And they would go, oh, well, actually, we wanted the director. Okay, fool, you're going to get what you expect. <laughs> Wait, come on. So that meant Barbara Herwald would have intense one-on-ones with me because I was going to go talk about what she did, which is what my major professor taught me you never do. But I had to. So I got a very steep learning curve from very good people who had a major stake in me not being stupid. <laughs> well, it's good to know that you can make it to that position uh, without perhaps knowing everything yet, but with a good uh, team. <laughs> you gotta be faced with a steep learning curve yeah. and a wife who will put up with a lot of grumbling at home and, and a lot of unrest at work. I mean, it was not an easy transition. There were a lot of people who didn't think I should be there. And that's the way it goes. I mean, I wasn't sure I should be there. I wasn't disagreeing with them. So after a couple of years, things settled out. There was a 
cryptosporidiosis outbreak in Milwaukee where 400,000 people had really bad diarrhea that I'd never heard of cryptosporidiosis, didn't know how to go about an outbreak investigation. Fortunately, I got to sit in Atlanta and send some really good people out there, but I was supposed to be telling them what to do sometimes. That's baptism by fire. But it all worked out in the end, sort of. Some people think so. I hope so. Uh, but after about eight, eight and a half years, I was getting very close to 60, like I was 59. And I decided that I really, I really belonged back in academia. This was great. I learned an incredible amount. But I probably had faked it as a public health official about as long as I could get away with it. <laughs> so I decided to start looking for another job. I also had 31 years in the federal government at that point and could retire from the federal government. So I went looking for jobs and a guy named Rick Tarleton at UGA had just started the Center for Tropical and Emerging Global Diseases. I was already on the adjunct faculty at UGA because it's like 70 miles from where I live. And I would come out once a year and give a lecture and blah, blah, blah. But Rick called and said, uh, I think I can talk them into getting a new director, not me. Would you be interested? And I went, um, but, but you just birthed this baby. Are you sure you don't want to be direct? And he said, no, I don't want to be direct. And I went, okay, let's talk this through. Because he wasn't going to leave. He was going to be there. And it was his baby. He put it together, convinced the administration to put money into it. And now suddenly he's going to hand it over to me, sit quietly on the sidelines. Mm. Well, fortunately, I had known Rick since he was an undergraduate. So we went. I went out, sat on his deck. We had a couple of beers and talked it all through. And he convinced me that he would be there if I needed him. If I needed background on stuff, but he would stay out of my hair. And he lived up to that entirely. So I went out, got a job at UGA as a professor of microbiology, but mainly also to be the director of CTETD, a totally unpronounceable acronym. Can't say that acronym. Um, that was maybe maybe even more than going to the CDC, was scary. Because I hadn't been in the lab in nine years. I had three people, George Freeman, Evan Secor, and Mac Powell, who kept me alive scientifically at CDC. They let me come to my lab meetings, basically. So I hadn't been in a lab, hadn't written a grant. Um, and even back at Vanderbilt, the VA, how long had it been since I'd really done the research? And at UGA, I was walking into a stone cold lab with a bunch of boxes, no technician, no postdoc, no graduate student, me. And I had to set up the life cycle again and be an immunologist again. And that was absolutely terrifying. It's nice to see a full circle. Yeah, so. it was. And, you know, I, I infected a bunch of mice and I had a summer student coming in so that they would be eight weeks infected at the time she arrived. And when I took her down to the mouse house and I sacrificed the mouse and I opened up the mouse, I was so delighted to find out that the spleen was still in the same place. <laughs> now the lymph nodes were too, but they were always hard to find. So I set up the life cycle, started doing mouse work, and started writing a grant to continue the work that Evan and I had been doing in Western Kenya with Diana Karanja while I was at CDC, because we had started in 1995, a program to look at immunology of a group of car washers and sand harvesters and school children who had schistosomiasis, that's Manson. And so that study was ongoing with me breaking it in the middle, going to UGA. I wrote an NIH grant because we already had this population. We already shown through publications that we could do it. And lo and behold, they gave me the grant. So I got my grant when I got back into academia about a year and a half later. 
And, but I never got the mouse work funded. The people who read the grants didn't want to do what I wanted to do. And they told me what I could do to get funded, but I didn't want to do it. So I was already deeply into Kenya and Diana Caranjo's program and Evan's program and our NIH grant plus some CDC things and Kimberly things. So I finally said, after about eight years of trying to get the mouse work, I mean, we got papers published, but that was done on UGA money and a wing and a prayer. Um, I finally got only human work going. And not, what, maybe, maybe a year after that decision to drop the mouse work, shut down the life cycle, Julie Jacobson called and score started. So I was still doing up until May of 2018, still doing the immunology of humans with Diana and Evan in the program at Kimry and all the postdocs. Um, but I wasn't doing mouse work. And that worked out just great. I'm a bit conscious about the time. Okay. So, um, I think uh, that, that was a fantastic overview of the 40 years pr preceding SCORE and, uh, and, and there's not many people that can say that they've spent half a century working on schistosomiasis. And I imagine that the there's a lot of people tuned in today and they have many, many questions. So I kind of want to hand over to Marianne and give the audience a chance to ask questions uh, because there's so many interesting topics that have been covered from operational issues to uh, career paths uh, that I'd like to hand over the floor to give someone else a chance to, to pick your brain. But thank you very much, Dan. Sure. My pleasure. Absolutely, Dan. Yeah, I hear you, Marianne. Join Juliet and. Oh, I can hear you. There you go. Any better now? Yeah, all good. Yep. Um, I was just yep. joining uh, my my words to Juliet and all our attendees uh, to thank you, Dan. Uh, you've certainly pushed the innovation in the field of schistosomiasis. I have personally never heard of a schisto quilt, uh, so that is certainly a legacy there. <laughs> Um, and you've had, while you were giving us all these wonderful anecdotes and stories and also for thought, a lot of hellos and many, many comments on our chat function from all our attendees. Just to name a very few, um, you've had a special hello from Merlene Fredericks from St. Lucia, also Arwana Frosa from Brazil, Andre da Silva, Rodrigo Correa, all saying hello from Brazil. Of course, uh, Tammy Andros is keeping an eye on you from the remote SCORE office. Um, <laughs> apparently, have, apparently we have Norleans in the house with uh, Ronald Blanton and uh, Joe Cook also has his drink ready to toast you uh, in a few moments, despite it being relatively early on the East Coast. Um, Susanna Lausella from Buenos Aires and also colleagues from Kenya, Mexico, Brazil, Leiden, uh, Tanzania, Bangkok, uh, London. <laughs> if I haven't had a chance to mention everyone, we will definitely collate all those wonderful uh, comments and hellos, present them very nicely to Dan uh, after, after this uh, chat. We've also got a few questions that have come in, Dan, for you. Uh, we probably take a few and then uh, please don't uh, leave because we, we have a little surprise in store. So don't disconnect attendees. And uh, Dan, I, I hope you're sitting comfortably because I am sure you'll enjoy this. <laughs> so perhaps while Dan answers a few questions, if everyone wants to go grab a container, a glass or some sort of uh, you know lovely uh, Tusk, as someone was mentioning, to to toast Dan later on. But in yeah. the meantime, uh, here's a, just a, a couple of things that sort of kept coming up on the chat. So first question was from Paul Hagen, who was asking uh, Dan, what piece of work brought to you the most satisfaction? A lot to choose from, I know. Wow, thanks, Paul. Um, hmm. <laughs> the most satisfaction. I, I, 
one of the very early things that I did in the mouse was to do passive adoptive transfers of lymphocytes from chronically infected mice to early infected mice and show that the granulomas were downregulated. Immunologically, that was really something for me. Uh, we had been proposing something like that. We had no evidence for it. And so that was direct evidence. And that was a high point, I think, in terms of mouse immunology. I think in terms of overall satisfaction, it doesn't come from the research. It comes from the training. It comes from all the people that you watch grow under your tutelage and with a lot of outside tutelage, but in your realm. And you watch the light bulb go off when they really start seeing their data as their data. And wow, this might be new. And I could think about this. Because up until that point, all, the only way we learn to do science is rope. And that's unfortunate. But once you see that happen, then that's extremely rewarding. And when you get to see it in lots of people over 50 years, it's really fun. That's very uh, good advice, and absolutely. And uh, any better now? Yeah. Can you hear me now, Dan and Juliet? Great. Um, so a lot of tech. There have been a lot of technical questions for you, Dan. So I don't think the community is quite ready to let you relax completely. But <laughs> perhaps we can email those to you um, separately, seeing as uh, time is quite short yeah. on this session. Um, but there was sort of a recurring uh, theme, of course, looking at the future. And and uh, so looking at the future so, and then we're in high demand Dan so when it comes to schisto interventions the future? Uh, the future lots of people were asking beyond MDA what are your thoughts on um, snail control community engagement there were quite a few comments of course about wash um, uh, that was a question by Amadou Jallo who was asking you know what what would you see beyond MDA and kind of that's, you know, into bringing together another question by Maria Jao Gouveia as well and leading to James Kazura's question, which was in what areas should operational research be directed in the next decade? Um, and just uh, as a note, I don't know if everyone's on the chat, but uh, Jura Gutzinger did also and Anouk Gouvras very kindly from the GSA both also uh, put a link to the um, next published score supplement uh, in the American Journal of Tropical Medicine. So if you want to Great. have a read Thank of that, you. the links of I will. Yeah, there's a lot in there. Uh, I'll try to unpack it a little bit. I would start with community engagement. And I do not consider community engagement separate from MDA. You don't have any MDA if you don't have community engagement. You just have somebody pushing pills, and that isn't what MDA should be. So I would just start by saying everything has to start with community engagement. And that's true whether you're doing research or whether you're doing operational research or whether you're doing programmatic things. It has to start with the community. You've got to explain what it is you're doing, why you're there, and if you don't, you can just drive on to the next village and try again, uh, from my perspective. So I consider community engagement integral to any kind of control program, no matter what you're doing. If you're going to go and use niclosamide and kill snails, you better explain that some fish are going to die or you're going to get run out of town. So, uh, and if you explain that, and then you explain that they can actually eat the fish because the clozomide is a human drug <laughs> at much higher levels than you use. Um, 
you can you can do something then. So community engagement is absolutely fundamental. I think that I didn't learn that at CDC. I didn't learn that in graduate school. I learned that from my mother. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. You can't do any of these things without engaging the people you're going to do it to because you really should be doing it with. Okay? Snail mm -hmm. control. Snail control, I mentioned engineering. That was a part of snail control when I entered Cisco. And it was effective. It could be done. It was dropped because we got a drug that was field usable. Project Quantum came on the scene, and it's great that it did. But we shouldn't have forgotten everything. Everybody always goes for the silver bullet when you really need to load your six gun with more than one bullet because you might miss. So snail control needs to be done, in my estimation, perhaps to bring down persistent hotspots. But I'm not talking about aerial spraying. I mean, I have photographs of aerial spraying of quasi quantal to cut down on lamprey eels in the Adirondack Mountains. I don't want that. I want local mollusca siding where people go to the water, where snails live. That's snail control to me. But you can also do it with engineering, which should be part of it. Cleaning vegetation. That's what snails live on. The Japanese did it by concreting all their, their waterways. Well, that's not likely to happen in Sub-Saharan Africa right away, but it works. So I do believe in snail control. I believe it should be focal. I think it should, it will take effort, but if you can spray for mosquitoes, you can spray for snails. Um, MDA is a stopgap in my mind. It's what we can do and should do. And we can do it well and we should do it well. There are lots of program managers out there that do know how to do it if they are supported enough to do it. So I think that that's something that must continue in conjunction with snail control, in conjunction with WASH. WASH, in my mind, and I've heard this said in a couple of places, I wasn't originating this, WASH is funded in a different sphere than NTD. We need to work with those folks who do walk, who drill wells, who make latrines or help people make latrines. We need to work with them and we can offer them some things in terms of readouts that you know, might not be the way they think about readouts, but you know, if you cut into Ascaris transmission because everybody's pooping down a hole. Well, okay. We're a worm because nobody's leaving those larvae out there. We can do things for them and they can do a whole lot for us. The guinea worm program of which I was the titular head at the CDC for a while with the Carter Center, um, did a pretty good job of getting in alignment with people drilling wells. There are lots of NGOs across Africa drilling wells, all different speckled across Africa. Find out where they are. Ask them if they can drill wells in your persistent hotspot. I, mean, I think there's a lot that can go on intersectorally. That, but everything starts with the community engagement, wash, MDA, snail control, all of that depends on getting the community involved. I will just say a word about intersectorial things. I have a graph, a chart that I show in most of my classes that even close, come close to touching on global health research. It's a big arrow. And the big arrow goes from basic research, bench science, basic, basic research, all the way to policy and implementation. 
And there are buckets along the way. There are buckets for operational research, for drug development, phase one, phase two, phase three, diagnostic development, and all these kinds of things until you get to the other end. And that's supposed to be a continuum, but we all know it isn't. It's a bunch of buckets. And getting people into a bar or across a card table talking to one another in those sectors is important. And that's a start. But one of the things that people, I think, have to realize if they are going to work intersectorially in any kind of success is that each bucket full of people has to realize that the reward system is different for different people in different buckets. As an academic, my reward system is publications. My reward system is publications so I can get a grant, so I can keep doing this job and not flipping burgers to feed my family. It's as simple as that. I don't get those publications. I don't get that grant. I don't have a research program. Okay. You move down to a program manager. Do they care about publications? Not many of them, because that's not what they're going to keep their job or be promoted on. They're going to be promoted on how well the program does. What's the coverage? Not, did you publish this study? And each group with different reward systems has to realize that if they're going to work with that other group, they have to let them get their reward system out of this or there won't be any collaboration. Sorry, why should I work with you? All you're interested in is publishing. And I want to get on with the next village. That's very wise so I words. Think that's, I think that's important. And I think it's going to, going to elimination of schistosomiasis is going to take all the bullets we can find. And it's going to take diagnostic bullets we don't have. We don't have them. We don't have good ways to tell whether somebody is infected when you're down to three, four, five percent. And yet we know that three, four, five percent can be 15 percent in two years. And that can be then 50 percent in four years. We don't have those tools. Somebody some people are working on them. A lot more people need to work on them. How many people are working on diagnostics for COVID-19 at this very second? Thousands of people, maybe tens of thousands. And that's good. We need that. I'm not saying they shouldn't be doing that. I'm saying we should be doing that too. We're NTDs. I don't even like neglected anymore. I'd rather it not be and, tropical disease. Of course. And you mentioned COVID, and that brings us on to our last question from the attendees, um, because it's inescapable. So Russell Stottard from the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine uh, was asking, with COVID-19, we are likely going to lose a lot of the gain ground on schistosomiasis control. But with your extensive immunological knowledge, might you expect any immunological crosstalk of schisto-infected populations with COVID-19 pathology? Hmm. Crosstalk immunologically. Well, certainly people who have severe COVID-19 have cytokine storms and the like. How would that impact their schisto? Probably not a lot, I wouldn't think. Uh, mm, when it gets systemic, it's going to make worms unhappy. No, no worms like lots of fever, uh, that's true. But we have a lot of people with schisto who have malaria with fever, doesn't cure their schisto. Um, for most, for the people who do not get severe clinical COVID-19, I doubt if it actually will make a lot of difference in schisto. Now, whether schisto predisposes people or something because of its 
more or less TH2ness. I don't like that split quite as much as some people. It's true, but not totally. Um, yeah, maybe, but I wouldn't expect so. I mean, the initial response to COVID-19 is not gamma interferon. That's eventual. It's, you know, it's type one. And so I, I would not expect TH2 to have a big impact on that. But immunologic systems continue to amaze me. So can I say no? I don't, I certainly can't say no, but I don't think so. I ain't done the study. Thank yet. you for that. So I have, one thing, I have one thing that I would like to do before we close this. I wrote a poem, which won't surprise some people, about this being my retirement. So if you will allow me, I will read this poem. What is this thing called retirement? Some say retirement is for getting away. Some say retirement is for getting to stay. It greatly depends on what you have done to get to this point and if it was fun. In my case, it means more staying at home, less time in those airports, less time on the roam. Perhaps I will have many fewer deadlines, times that so often feel like landmines. Will it prove me more time to think? Or will it mean now I must clean the sink? Perhaps I will need to learn a new skill, but I hope that ability won't bring a big bill. All I have done for the past 50 years has been quite fulfilling with very few tears. That's clearly because of the people involved, from family to lab and as colleagues revolved. For all the cool science and great public health, it's those who surround you who you count as your wealth. So maybe retirement will be a great thing, I'll learn how to paint or maybe to sing. I have people who would wish that, not true. Sure. But what I will miss, certainly the most, will be those I know well and who I now toast. Thank you. That's beautiful. Thank, thank you so much. Um, round of applause, Dan. <laughs> yeah. And uh, we also have a small gift for you as well, Dan. Uh, obviously, this year has been completely upside down. So, on a you know, very, with very little time to prepare, um, basically we've got a lot of people here who have um, sent in a little congratulations or just a little hello to wish you well on your retirement. I'm sure you'll recognize many, many uh, people here. And as I said, anyone who the whole sort of uh, d discussions on the chat, we will send that over to you, Dan, as well. So. Uh, I'm, you know, we're very apologetic if we've missed anybody, but we we tried our best. And so take a very comfortable seat, Dan, and uh, enjoy this little tour of the world. Hi, Dan. Thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and experiences. It's been a wonderful uh, experience to hear all about your exciting times with Sister Samaritan's research. Now, GSA could not let this occasion pass without a few extra words from your many friends and colleagues and collaborators around the world. Dan, you had a truly outstanding career, always combining the best of field and laboratory research. I always remember uh, our discussions, perhaps some of our earlier discussions, when we met in a hot and crowded transit lounge uh, on the way to a Welcome Trust meeting in, in Kenya. Uh, you were on the way to Kisumu and I was on the way to uh, Zanzibar. You had many different supplies with you and I was trying to keep track of various boxes, all those things that we need for schistosomiasis research. Now that was many years ago and indeed many projects ago and your enthusiasm and determination has never waned. You've always been there, always at the forefront of schistosomiasis research. So a huge personal thanks from me for your leadership and contributions which have really helped to move the control of schistosomiasis forward and eventually we will reach that elimination point. Olá, Dan, tudo bem? Hi, Dan. Well, Dan, you know there's, there's retirement that doesn't come, it's just change of plans. We have we have a long history together, uh, Dan, between you and Andrea and Giovanni and all of us have become major friends in this uh, journey for our life. 
Your programs with us have actually led to very, very important science. And it's very, very important to know to people in terms of their capacity in science. So I think that uh, your contribution has been amazing and fantastic. And we all have to thank you for that. Uh, we, we've known each other for more than 40 years. And uh, one thing that I think it's uh, interesting to remember is that, uh, that uh, you also created Gringolândia, uh, the apartment for scientists downtown Belo Horizonte. Uh, they used to come to stay with us working in our projects from different states in Brazil and in different countries all over the world. And Mary was of a major importance to organize and get uh, getting everything together in the apartment, even books for people to read while staying in there. Your friendship is undoubtedly is extremely important for us. Enjoy your retirement. You know we will always be around in case you need. Aproveite muito. Um abraço. Hi, Dan. I wish we could be doing this in person. It's hard to think of something funny or witty to say when I'm talking into my cell phone. So I'll just say this, that long ago, Evan Secor once told me that my postdoc was going to be the best time of my career. And at the time, I thought he was being rather defeatist, but 10 years post-postdoc, if you can believe it, I have to concede he was probably right. Um, my job isn't nearly as much fun these days, and my current boss doesn't have any snow globes made of schistosomes in his office with a picture of him and Lederhosen in the middle, or any jars full of botflies that were extracted from his back, or any jars full of any critters for that matter. And even though I'm not a parasitologist, you taught me the most valuable lesson, and I think of you almost daily when I repeat in my head that science is easy, people are hard. I hope that you have a long, happy retirement and that you find things to do other than drive Mary Paxton crazy. If I had more time to prepare for this, I would have tried to find a Stony or a Tusker to toast you with, but this will have to do, so cheers. Hi, Dan Coley. This is Saidi from Pemba PHL. I wish you a happy retirement and prosperous new life. Thank you. Hey, Dan. Somewhere north of 45 years ago, I made one of the best decisions in my life by begging you to be my graduate school advisor. I'm not so sure you made such a great decision in saying yes, though. And I want to thank you again for not giving me the boot when I ran the mini into the ditch on St. Lucia. For decades now, you've been a terrific mentor, colleague, and friend. And I don't see that changing any time in the near future. I'm so sorry we couldn't be there in person for you, but I'm happy to have a chance to participate in this virtual tribute and to say thank you so much for everything you've done for me and for all of us. Greetings, Dan, from one of your oldest collaborators. I'm happy to seize the opportunity to thank you for all you've done for schistosomiasis research, especially the help that you gave me at the Clark Foundation searching for a vaccine for Shisto. Well, we may have to wait a little longer, but your leadership in the SCORE program has led to immediate benefits in Africa and will continue to do so. So good wishes to you and to Mary Paxton as you sail on this new adventure. Take care, Dan. Goodbye. Hi, Dan. I hear you are joining the old age pensioners ranks. I hope you will enjoy it as much as I have. I think we've known each other for almost 40 years now at meetings and also skiing in different parts of the world. Um, I particularly remember one time in Chamonix where a Christmas tree refused to budge when you were skiing towards it. That cut our uh, Chamonix outing a bit short and we went back to Geneva in the car and you said nothing which concerned me a bit. And, and I was even more concerned when you said, I know who you are, Robert, but I don't know where I am or where we are or anything else. Uh, I thought of going straight to the hospital, but soon after you did remember that you were in Geneva for a steering committee meeting at uh, WHO, TDR. And uh, you excelled as usual the next day at their meeting, telling us all how long and winding the route to a schistosomiasis vaccine will be, how prophetic that is. 
Maybe you should tell the corona people that the same is for them, the same holds for them. Uh, let me just end by saying that I have been retired for 21 years and it's been a blissful time without the salary, but still fine and I hope you enjoy the same. Bye. Hi, I met Dan in November 1974 on a mountaintop in Southern Virginia in the village of Fancy Gap. From those very early days, I was much impressed with Dan's commitment to his research. I remember when he, in Nashville, he would take home cages of mice so that he could do measurements on those animals infected with schisto during the evening and during the night. <clears throat> Through Fancy Gap meetings, I and other gappers followed the progression of Dan's creativity and productivity his training of young scientists, his leadership at meetings of the AAI and the American Society of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, and his professional contributions to the NIH, WHO, and most recently, the SCORE program. My strongest feelings about Dan are those of our friendship for the past four and a half decades. Dan is a caring person and I'm proud to be called his friend. Now he's retiring, hanging up his spurs, and pretty soon, he's probably going to understand that every day can be Saturday. Good luck in your retirement, Dan. You know, and I, you and I will be in close contact. Congratulations. Dan, Stephen Katz here. I'm privileged to have been invited to say a few words in tribute to you for your 50-year career in schistosomiasis research. First of all, as I reflect, it's hard for me to believe that your career spanned 50 years and that I came to your lab 48 years ago. You've impacted my life every day since. You know, I really don't have any funny stories to tell, but I will say that there was never a day I did not look forward to being in, in the lab. It was an exciting place, thanks to you. When I finished there, there were a few words that you wrote and I will quote because I have carried these words with me ever since. To Steve, December 11th, 1975. This lab is such that as you know, the space doth shrink and the volume grow. This has in time caused us to share many a joy and some gray hair. You should be sure as you depart that we are sad with a happy heart. DGC. Dan, I respect your intellectual integrity, your demeanor, and your pursuit of knowledge. You have made my life and the life of the world better. I'm honored to be part of your academic lineage. From my heart, know that I will always be grateful to you, Professor Colley. Our best to you now and always enjoy the moment.
welcome to the Congo Room here at Swiss Tropical and Public Health Institute. You see by flare your glabrata snails taken from Brazil, country you love. Then just three things I would like to share with you. First, your scientific contribution, outstanding. Secondly, the way you promote the young people, including myself, you wrote my recommendation letter for the associate professor, deeply appreciated. Third, the way you moved score forward helped us together with our colleagues in Cote d'Ivoire, outstanding. Dear Dan, my heartfelt congratulations to 50 years of great work you did. I take you to our garden, present you a little bit of Swissness with that cow and the beautiful garden of Swiss TPH. All the best from my side. Definitely one of my highlights working here, meeting you and being dedicated to this poem. Um, I would like, uh, like to say a few words from this poem. In the end, you feel fine and the friends that you make are like sipping fine wine. You're definitely one of these friends. Wishing you all the best and see you. Bye bye. Hello everyone. My name is Eric Ndombe from Kenya. I'm proud and happy to share my short tribute to Professor Kohli as he retires. Professor Dan Kohli came to Kenya in the year 1995, established a very fruitful collaboration on schistosomiasis research he helped to build a state-of-the-art laboratory in Western Kenya, and I'm one of those who benefited from his training grant on schistosomiasis immunology uh, up to PhD level. Asante sana, Professor Kohli, and all the best on your retirement. I am Dr. Safari Kinuhi, Director of the National Institute for Medical Research in Mwanza, Tanzania. I join the other colleagues in congratulating Dan on his official retirement. Dan, it has been a pleasure working with you over the past 10 years. Important information has been generated relevant to schistosomiasis control and elimination. Words cannot fully describe your accomplishment in this regard. The score network which you created will continue the work which you started 50 years ago. The school project has been a good learning experience for me and I hope for others. I thank you so much for spearheading publication of the school findings into a journal supplement which will contribute to your everlasting legacy. I congratulate you so much and wish you a very happy retirement. Dan, congratulations on 50 years of research in the field of schistosomiasis. On my right, you can see a picture of the schistosoma pair on a papyrus from Egypt, something you should know well. And on the left, you will see uh, Theodore Bilharts, the founder of our field. Again, you've made real significant and valuable contributions that have allowed our field to move ahead. Congratulations, and I wish you the best in the next chapter of your life. Hello Dan, Marin and I and the whole family join with me in wishing you a very happy retirement. We first met at Mill Hill, then in Brazil and then at your home in Athens. We enjoyed your wonderful hospitality and your loving care. We're all with a Christian foundation and your scientific rectitude and observations. We wish you a very happy retirement. Hi Dan, I'm very happy to send you this message today. We are here to celebrate 50 years of a work in the field of stosomiasis. <laughs> and I have just one minute to summarize everything I need to say. But what can I say other than thank you? Your work had helped many countries and agencies. Your work had inspired a lot of researchers. So thank you very much. Muito obrigado. I hope you enjoy your retirement together with your uh, family and loved ones. You deserve it. But of course, if by any chance you miss the summits in the future, you know where to find all of us. So thank you once again. All the best. 
and stay safe. Professor Dan Colley from Alan Fenwick. We didn't know each other for the first 20 years of your working life. When you did fantastic schisto research in Brazil, in Egypt and in the States. But from 1988 onwards, when I took over as the project manager of the uh, Schisto research project in Egypt, and then through the time with SCI and your work with SCORE, we have worked very, very closely together. We've met on many occasions in many different countries and sitting on many different committees with the World Health Organization in particular and at those wonderful ASTMH meetings uh, which were held annually in America. Dan, it's been such a pleasure working with you. As you know, I have the highest admiration for your intellect and for your, um, for your work and your results and I've never heard anybody say a single word in detriment to what you've managed to achieve. As you know, I've beaten you to retirement and I can assure you that if you enter it into the correct spirit, it isn't that bad after all. I think a lot of people have said, both of you and of me, we never would retire, but sadly the time has come to hand over and let the youth of today uh, do what needs to be done against schistosomiasis and other NTDs. So, Dan, I know over the last couple of years you have had a couple of health problems, uh, but I hope that they've now completely cleared up and that you have a long and healthy retirement and that somehow you and I can meet up again. So, very best of wishes and thank you for being Dan Colley, your friend, Alan. Dear Dan, or well, the Shisto kid, congratulations Dan for a long-standing career in schistosomiasis and many thanks for all the efforts that you've done over the years controlling this disease and also the efforts you've done on uh, immunology of uh, Chagas disease. So wish you all the best for your retirement and I send you this lovely image of you, David and Joseph for Krauss examining uh, the amount of beer in each glass. So have a drink on me. Best wishes, Ross. So for those of you uh, who might have a glass, a mug or a bottle to hand, please raise it and share with me a toast for Dan to wish him a very happy and healthy future. Thank you, Dan. A great scientist, an exemplary role model, an all round decent bloke. That sums up Dan Colley. You know, as uh, Fiona Fleming wrote on the chat, um, this was really a lovely, a great tribute from those who love and respect you. And um, Srimantha Parida was saying, uh, looking forward to reading your autobiography soon. <laughs> so lots of great wishes um, from uh, us all. That's great. I, this was overwhelming. I really appreciate the society letting this happen. Um, I wasn't expecting all that. And I, I think as your friend said, you know, uh, they were very sorry not to be able to do something in person for you. So this is only a very, very small gesture. Um, uh, lots of videos still coming in. So we will add them to the file and uh, we'll get that sent over to you along with, with all the many, many wishes now pouring in uh, on the chat function. So we've had you it's been our pleasure and uh, our you know we've had you for a long time this afternoon uh thank you so much for taking the time to tell us please your thoughts for the future as uh, one of the attendees said this has been schisto heaven <laughs> well some of us like it and, uh, <laughs> but we yes <laughs> absolutely yeah. So uh, as a final word, again, a very big thank you, Dan, to, to you today for participating and also, you know, for the past 50 years, everyone's very keen to keep in touch. So uh, we hope to, once the COVID situation is over, we hope to be able to yep. be in touch and meet again very, very soon. Well, thank you, Marianne. I appreciate this. I appreciate the society doing this for me. 
giving me this opportunity. It's been our pleasure. Very and good. Thank you very much, Julia, for bringing out the best of Dan, the best <laughs> stories. Um, and so from us to both of you and also to all our attendees, uh, it's goodbye for now. Thank you so much for tuning in. Uh, have a great weekend. Take care. Keep safe. All the best from London and hopefully see you very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you again, Dan. Bye now. And thanks, Juliet. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.